Hey guys, welcome back to Pop em Up Chem and the last video in the Unit 4 and 14 video series. And in this video, we're going to be looking at ionic bonding. We're going to look at the nature of ionic bonding and some of the properties that arises from this type of bonding. Firstly though, what two factors affect the strength of a metallic bond? Pause the video and see if you can remember that from the last video. So hopefully you remembered that when we're thinking about metallic bonds, really their strength is regulated by the charge density of the individual ions that are bonding together. This is regulated by two main factors. One, the size, small size gives us a larger charge density. And of course, the overall charge or the numbers of electrons given to the delocalized electron cloud. So before we look at ionic bonding, Let's first introduce ions. So simple ions are monoatomic ions, AKA they exist on the periodic table. So positive monoatomic ions are formed when metals lose their valence electrons, i.e. group one has one plus ions, lithium plus, and group two has two plus ions, e.g. magnesium plus. Now the transition metals have variable uh, oxidation states. So if you've already done the unit three video, you will already know a little bit about that. For example, iron can form plus two or plus three charge. And we usually write that with the two or three in Roman numerals in brackets. So negative monoatomic ions are formed when non-metals gain electrons. So they have a negative charge. And these are also related to the group they're in uh, because they want to complete their outer shell. See the octet rule from earlier in the unit. So we get group five non-metals forming negative three ions. For example, that'd be nitrogen three minus. Group six, we get two minus ions. So that would be O two minus. And so these are quite easy because we can use the periodic table to determine the charge of these simple ions. So polyatomic ions are a little bit more complex. These are individual covalent compounds that then lose or gain electrons. So these can be drawn using the rules we learned earlier in the unit for drawing the Lewis structures of molecules and ions. For example, we can draw the sulfate ion, that's SO4 to minus using those rules. And there are also some other common negative ions. So nitrate, hydroxide, phosphate, carbonate, and hydrogen carbonate. There's a lot less polyatomic positive ions the main one we're going to look at our IB is going to be NH4+, the ammonium ion. So before we look at the bonding, let's look at how we write the ionic compound formulae. So the first thing we want to remember is that these compounds have an overall charge of zero. And if we bear that in mind, then we can just use the charge of each of the ions and then balance them out. So let's take calcium fluoride, for example, calcium, and fluorine. So calcium is in group two. So it has a two plus charge and fluorine is in group seven. So it has a one minus charge. So we can almost think of how we solve this as cross multiplying. We know that we need to balance out a two plus charge with fluorine and a one minus charge with calcium. So cross multiplying will give us Ca times one, or negative one, but we're always going to use the uh, positive integer and fluorine two, CaF2. Let's try the same again, but this time with iron two chloride. So here we have iron and because it's been given to us in the name, the oxidation state, we know it's going to be Fe2 plus and chlorine is of course in group seven. So we're going to have a negative one charge on that. So we do our cross multiplication once again, and we end up with Fe multiplied by one and chlorine multiplied by two. When we cross multiply FeCl2. 
Let's do another example with polyatomic ions. So let's look at ammonium sulfate. Okay, so ammonium is NH4 plus, one plus charge, and sulfate is SO4 two minus. Now you do need to remember the names and formulae of these. If you do want a little cheat sheet, table 20 of the data booklet actually has the formula of most of these, but for enthalpy of hydration. And as long as you're able to remember the name, then you'll be able to use that table to help you if you blank in an exam. So doing the same as we've done previously, except putting any polyatomic ions that are multiplied in brackets, uh, as we have NH4 multiplied by two, the charge on the sulfate, and SO4, one. Now, if you want to name an ionic compound that you don't know the name of, we're effectively going to do the inverse process of writing the formula. And this works also in a systematic way where the cation of the ionic compound gives the first part of the name and the anion of the compound gives the second part of the name. So if we take the example of calcium chloride, then we've got CaCl2 and the cation is the calcium and the anion is the chlorine or the chloride ion Cl minus. So here we're going to have calcium chloride and we change the end part of the name when we have a negative oxidation state of the atom to the IDE. That's for our simple anions. That's only for simple. Uh, we'll have a little look at a polyatomic one now. Okay, so if we say have NH4, 3, PO4, here we have our positive ion is the ammonium cation and the negative ion is the phosphate anion. So here we're going to have ammonium is going to come from the cation and phosphate and we have the ATE indicates that we have a positive oxidation state on the phosphorus group there. We'll do more about that in unit nine. But for now, you just need to remember that the polyatomic anions end in this ATE. This really is core skill stuff here. So let's do some whiteboard questions and then I'll give you some more questions to do by yourself. First question, what is the formula for the sulfate ion? Pause the video and have a go. Popama. Hopefully you remembered. If not just yet, that's okay. But it is SO4 2 minus. Remember you got table 20 to help you. What is the formula for sodium sulfate? Pause the video to have a go at that. Pop them up. So we have sodium sulfate. So we know sodium is the cation and sulfate is the anion. We can do our cross multiplication. So we know we're going to have Na2SO4. What is the name of the compound Na3PO4? Pause the video to have a go at that. Pop them up. So our first word comes from our cation, which here is sodium. And the second word comes from our anion, which here is the phosphate group. So we're going to have sodium phosphate as the name of this compound. Here are some questions you can practice pausing, taking a bit more time for yourself to do them, where we're just looking at adding the atoms and ions together and giving the names and the formulae of the ionic compounds. Pause the video and take some time with that. So I'll just run through the answers. For number one, we're going to have LiF, lithium fluoride. Two, MgI2, magnesium iodide. Number three, Al2O3, aluminium oxide. Four, FeS, iron sulfide, iron two sulfide. Number five, Ca3N2, calcium nitride. Number six, Na2SO4, sodium sulfate. Number seven, NH4Cl, ammonium chloride. Number eight, Fe2SO4 brackets three, and that's iron three sulfate. 
number nine, FeNO3 in brackets two, iron two nitrate, and number 10, K2CO3, and that's potassium carbonate. Okay, so hopefully you got some good practice there. Now we're going to look more specifically at ionic bonds themselves. So ionic bonds are formed when there's an electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged ions. That's kind of our definition of it. So we can model this with simple ions. So if we draw a diagram of NaCl, now we can give the electron configuration, but in the diagrams, I'm just gonna use the principal quantum number. So obviously sodium, we have the 3s1 as the outer shell and chlorine, we have the 3s2, 3p6 as the outer shell. So if we draw electrons in each of the energy shells representing uh, their electron configuration, we see that sodium has one in its outer shell and chlorine has seven. So in an ionic bond, what can happen is we can have a transfer of electrons. So in this situation, the sodium, which would happily allow this electron to leave, transfers its electron to the chlorine. Now what we end up with is we end up with an Na plus ion and a Cl minus ion that are very attracted to each other because of their opposite charge. That's the force of attraction between them that makes the ionic bond. In reality, we don't get ionic molecules that just have two atoms or ions bonded together. This attraction, positive and negative, is unidirectional. So it operates in all directions and so any positive or negative charge attracts positive or negative charges that are opposite from all directions towards itself. And this forms a 3D regular repeating crystal lattice structure. So taking NaCl as an example, if we focus on sodium as the central uh, ion that we focus on, what ends up happening is we see that six individual chloride ions crowd around the central sodium atom, forming this kind of octahedral structure. So this would indicate that NaCl would be instead NaCl6. So what's going on here? Well, the truth is that the same is also true of every single Cl atom. If we focus with our Cl atom in the center, we also see that that unidirectionally attracts Na plus ions towards it in the same arrangement. When we combine these two perspectives, we end up with this regular repeating pattern or crystal structure where this array continues to repeat itself over and over and over again, forming that infinite 3D regular repeating crystal lattice structure. So what kind of properties do these ionic structures actually give? Well, we have high melting and boiling points. These are very brittle. They do not conduct electricity while they're in solid form. However, they do conduct electricity when they are molten or they're in their liquid form or when they're dissolved in a solvent. In terms of solvents, they're very soluble in polar solvents and insoluble in non-polar solvents, which makes sense because if we look at the structure, we'd expect the polarity to interact with the charge of all of the ions. Now, when we think about explaining the first of these properties, high melting and boiling point, then hopefully we should see there's a pretty clear reason for this. Opposite charges are very attracted to each other and so they require a large amount of energy to separate the individual ions and thus that means we would expect there to be a high melting point to overcome those forces of attraction. Understanding them being brittle is a little bit more nuanced. So what does brittle mean? Well, it means they easily snap under a force exerted on them. That means if we apply an external force in opposite directions to the ionic compound, then the molecule would break apart. And this makes sense. If we think about sliding these layers over each other, like in metals, however, the difference here is if we are to shift the two layers that are next to each other across each other 
as we move one ion across, we're going to end up in a position where we have positive charges and negative charges lined up opposite each other. And this is going to cause a repulsive force. So shifting the layers causes those same charges to line up, causes the repulsion and thus a crack in the molecule. Lastly, we can use this structure to explain this duality of electrical conductivity. We know that electricity is the movement of charge. We have the ability of charge to move through a substance. So in metals, that was the migration of electrons. So when ionic compounds are solid, we can see that in this rigid lattice, there's no free electrons and there's no free ions. So everything is fixed in place. And because everything is fixed in place, it does not conduct electricity. However, if we melt or dissolve ionic compounds, then all of a sudden we're left with free ions. And free ions are able to move. And because they have charge, it means that they're able to move charge through the substance and thus conduct electricity. Now, it's important to remember here is the ions that are moving, not electrons like in metallic bonds. So if we put electrodes in this substance, then we will see a migration of the negative ions towards the positive electrode. And we will see the migration of positive ions towards the negative electrode. And we'll be looking more at that specific process of electrolysis in unit nine. But for now, it's enough for us to just be linking the structure to these properties. So let's finish up the video with some questions. The first question, what type of structure do ionic compounds form? Pause the video to have a go at that. Pop them up. So hopefully we remembered that we form a 3D giant regular repeating crystal lattice structure. Next question, why are ionic compounds brittle? Pause the video and have a go. Pop them up. So hopefully you remembered that because we have that alternate positive and negative lattice structure, when we shift the layers across each other, we end up with ions of the same charge lined up. And when that happens, they have a repulsive force and that causes a break in the crystal structure. Last question then, how can ionic compounds conduct electricity when molten? Pause and go. Pop them up. Hopefully you remembered that when we have a molten or dissolved ionic compound, we have mobile ions and mobile ions allow for the movement of charge, which is electricity. So there's no practical with this video and it is the last one of this unit. There are some questions to consolidate your understanding. Thanks for joining me guys. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell icon, check out the other videos. And as always, practice makes slightly better.